So, so my name is Justin Kanza. Um, I'm a former master's student at SOAS, studied development economist, um, economics. Um, I'm also a member of the Black Economist Network, um, which is focused on connecting the disparate Black economists um, across the world. Um, today's talk um, is titled The Hokum of Neoliberalism, um, Revisiting Sivanandan's Political Economy. Um, it's part of SOAS's 2020 and 2021 to 2021 um, economics webinar series, um, which is titled Intensifying Inequalities and the Limitations of Global Capitalism. Um, the aim is to bring together perspectives that extend our ex understanding of inequalities um, and how they take root in our societies and economies and how these relate to the crises of global capitalism. So these will include contributions from across the spectrum within and without um, economics um, from feminist economists, racial inequalities and economic imperialism. Um, joining us today, um, it's our pleasure to have Dr. John Narayan and Professor Gargi Bhattacharya. Um, so John will be, um, John is a lecturer from in European and international studies. Um, his most recent research has focused on the understudied transnationalism of US and British black power and the political theory created by groups such as the Black Panther Party. Um, Gargi um, is gonna discuss after John's speech and he, she is uh, the professor of sociology at the University of East London. Her research interests are in the areas of race and racism, sexuality, global cultures, and the war on terror, and increasingly austerity and racial capitalism. Her most recent book is Rethinking Racial Capitalism, Questions of Reproduction and Survival, which was published in 2018. So um, just some housekeeping of how this um, webinar will go. So John will speak for about 40 minutes followed by Gargi's discussion, which will be around 15 minutes. And then we'll take questions from you guys watching um, for about 20 to 23 minutes. So if you want a, to ask a question throughout the speech at any point, just type it out in the chat box. And then at the end, um, I'll relay them to our wonderful guests. So I think, you know, you didn't come here for me. So without further ado, John, whenever you're ready, don't worry, I don't think they came here for me either. <laughs> um, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you for the invite. Um, this is going to be, I've got some slides just basically to remind me of what to say. They're not really for you, so bear with me um, when they seemingly disappeared. So what we're going to talk about today is, if I can get this to load, is Sivanandan's kind of political economy and the title of the talk is entitled The Hockham of, of Neoliberalism, which plays on the title of one of Sivananda's famous articles. So we, I'm gonna try and share my screen with you guys. Uh, there we go, I'll go full screen, click on the start. You all can see my screen, right? Yeah, Gargi, can you see that? Yeah, no? I am apparently screen sharing. I can okay. see the screen, yeah. Thank you. So we're going to, we're just, this is a kind of brief introduction to the kind of political economy of Sivanandan, and then we'll talk about some kind of cool stuff at the end about how evil Britain is. And then, then we'll just have a discussion about race and class. That's the kind of way we're going to go today. So um, where do we start? Let's start with Sivanandan's biography, because I know many of you um, essentially may not know who Sivanandan is, although looking at the people in the room, a lot of you do know who Sivanandan is quite closely. Um, so Sivanandan was born in Ceylon in 1923, was an ethnic Tamil, left Sri Lanka due to anti-Tamil violence in 1958, and walks into the UK into the Notting Hill riots in 1958, which radicalizes his idea of, of what race and racism and class is doing. In a kind of brief truncated kind of biography, uh, Sivananda joins the Institute of Race Relations in 1964 and with others would transform what the Institute of uh, Race Relations, which was essentially um, a kind of government funded think tank, um, although I see Jenny Bourne's in it, so maybe she'll give us more of the history, 
in the in the Q and A. Um, and with others, not him, because I saw that the uh, Institute for Race Relations corrected a Guardian article recently, which seems to say Sivan Andam was doing it all. But a whole bunch of people, they essentially liberate the Institute of Race Relations in 1972, um, losing all of their funding, but transforming the journal that was attached to the, the old Institute from race into, into what became known as race and class. And many of us have, have kind of read this for years. And ultimately that, that journal was dedicated to the kind of liberation of the, of, of, the, of the black and third world struggles, which were happening in the 1960s onwards. And how I like to kind of see Sivanandan is, Sivanandan is in some ways the kind of conscious of Brit British anti-racism. And what that means is, is that those of us who come through uh, university or through activism will come across Sivanandan's work, will come across them as first principles about what anti-racism should be, how we should play, approach race and class. And in many ways, they, those principles, those first principles that we get from Sivanandan stick with us throughout our entire kind of um, careers, struggles or whatever they are. And that really because he's the kind of best narrator in, the, in both in form, in the way that he writes in essays and lyrically um, of the kind of British anti-racist experience, which we can trace from the post-war era into the emergence of kind of black power in Britain, um, the emergence of powerlism, which which essentially transforms Britain's idea of its kind of racial, racial hierarchy and what it meant for Britain to have an empire or not have an empire anymore, to the emergence of the British black power, which Sivananda was it tied to movements like the uh, British Black Panther movement and activists like Dark as Hell, to the focus against immigration laws, which were racist, and the kind of emergence even of, of struggles beyond that era, moving into black feminism, the kind of early work of Olive Morris. And all of that is encompassed in these histories that we have uh, written down by Sivan Andan. So for, for me, my first experience of picking up his work was um, that the wonderful essay which charts the kind of movement from resistance to rebellion that outlays all of that history for, for readers, both then and now. Right, so that article was written in the 1980s. It's still, written, it's still read today. I gave it to my first years to read. Um, only a few months ago, and they'll get it. They'll get it again soon. And so we have the, these kind of collections of writings that I said as Sivan Adan is the kind of um, conscience of British anti-racism. And apart from what is essentially a biography, an autobiography, Sivan Adan is also authentic in the sense that there is no real monograph. There are interventions in race and class and in other places. Um, which show you the kind of urgency of what the writing was for. The writing was urgent, so it was in essay form, so it was so it was easily photocopied. Many of Sivan Adams' articles became kind of underground classics because they were photocopied and passed around meetings. In fact, my kind of first encounter of him wasn't via kind of a proper text. It was it was a photocopied um, a photocopied essay that someone had given to me um, at a kind of I would call them an activist meeting, right? And so you have these wonderful collections of urgency. And of course, Sivan Andan is the ultimate one-liner in British anti-racism. He's the ultimate coiner of phrases uh, and, and, and kind of lines, right? So we carry our passport on our faces. We are here because you were there. My new kind of favorite is whatever else Brexit means or does not mean, it certainly means racism, right? Which is always good to bring out at uh, lefty meetings that are for Brexit. Um, and so we have this kind of sense of who Stephen Andon is for many of us. But, right, and one of the things I've kind of been thinking about as I've been working in the kind of era, uh, area of political economy and international political economy and the theorization of kind of class relations is often the idea of race and racism and exploitation is, and racial, how exploitation kind of works through that nexus is kind of like an afterthought, right? But everything that I had read had already done, had already outlined that for me. And Sivanandan's political economy is largely neglected by that field, uh, both of economics and both of political economy. It's not cited at all within the literature. And it's kind of interesting. You can kind of bring out a couple of Sivanandan's phrases in some of these uh, places and people are like, oh, what does that mean, right? And so as early on as 1975, Sivanandan would write, capital requires racism, not for racism's sake, but for the sake of capital. 
racism changes in order that capital might survive. And I tweeted this, I think about a year ago, and many, someone wrote back going, I've been working my whole career on trying to um, summarize this relationship and he's just done it in two lines. And that's the beauty of Sivan Andan's work is it's in one way so simply written, but in other ways it's, it's so simply written in a complex way. It's, it's simple complexity. So I wanna talk about this kind of political economy uh, work of Sivan Andan, which is, it's just kind of, I think, neglected. All right, so. Let's start with the article that I'm not actually going to talk that much about. I'll return to it, but I'm actually going to talk about other stuff first, but just because I feel like this is a, uh, a meeting point of where to start. In, um, well, the article claims that it's published on the 1st of January 1990, but it would have been written in the late 80s. Um, Sivan Andan publishes a piece called All That, uh, called The Hockham of New Times, right? Which is a, um, which is a kind of, in anti-racist causes, what you could see a kind of conflict between him and Stuart Hall, but really is a conflict between um, Sivan Andan, the Institute of Race Relations, an idea of race and class, and the theorization that is happening in, in what is essentially the old journal of the Communist Party called the New Times, right, which had been run by Martin Jacks, uh, Stuart Hall, and a bunch of others who were re-theorizing, re-theorizing what the left should be in the emergence of factorism, and how factorism had decimated traditional left-wing politics and needed, there was needed to be a rebranding of the Labour Party and the Labour movement itself to deal with the kind of fractions and fissures that neoliberalism had caused, right? And this was the kind of the classic theorization of factorism as authoritarian populism, the kind of idea that you have fascism without fascists um, and you have a new set of scenarios for the left to deal with in Britain because it was no longer the kind of old organized left that could simply walk up, organize, um, unionize, uh, organize and walk out and kind of defeat capital that way. And Siva's piece on this is a wonderful polemic, but it, what it does is to kind of castigate this New Times movement um, in, for doing a number of things, right? One Siva says is that although Hall and co talk about kind of changes in the global economy, which are fragmenting the kind of old idea of class and that the subject um, is re-emerging in modernity across multiple forms of identity. Really, that misses the kind of real change that has happened from the late 70s onwards, which is the massive change in the global economy, the new international division of labor and the process that we could call that we will call globalization, right? Written into this kind of critique is Sivan Andan's kind of critique of, of the New Times' idea that class itself had started to kind of disappear, or itself was only another form of identity. And this was linked to the idea that essentially there were new social movements linked around issues of identity, such as ethnicity, such as gender, um, sexuality, the, the green movement, which were now the kind of main pushes of a potential resistance to um, neoliberal market imperatives. And Sivan Andan saw this really as accommodating neoliberal takes which tried to dismiss the idea of class. Finally, uh, no, predominantly, um, also there was a refusal to see the kind of naked power of the state and the state itself wasn't uh, kind of taking a back seat to capital but itself was becoming an interventionist state in the interest of capital. And this was all premised hiding in the background of the kind of critique of the New Times project was both the visibility and the invisibility of, of the third world, right? And that largely is non-white peoples. And what Sivan Andan's basic argument was, is that there was a methodological nationalist focus on, on what had happened in Britain, the changes that had happened to the economy, how that impacted left-wing politics, had largely made invisible how the masses in the third world had started to be integrated into the global economy. And his argument was, well, the only time they were actually visible, and Hall and Cole would sometimes celebrate this, um, was in kind of charity events like uh, Band Aid, Live Aid, right? And his argument was, well, actually, the real invisibleness of this is what, what, what's happening in the global economy. So that's the kind of loose critique of this. But that critique that happens in the start of the 90s is really the culmination of at least two decades of work on British political economy and global political economy 
which Sivanandan has kind of excavated. I just want to excavate this in really simple terms, uh, going across a number of essays, just to get to a hint of what really he's getting at when he's critiquing Paul and Co. And also what we can kind of recover um, for our contemporary moment in Britain and the globe today. All right, so I'm actually going to start back at another essay, right, in the mid 70s. This is way before the Hockham of uh, New Times, and it's an essay called Race, Class and the State, right, written in 1976. Dedicated to Wesley Dick, um, who was one of the protagonists in the Spaghetti House siege. If you don't know what that is, Google it. Um, but it was essentially black power activists attempting to gain money to, to actually further black liberation. Some people say it was just people robbing a uh, set of restaurants, but that's actually not true. Um, if you read this essay, what it does is it narrates uh, British immigration control via an idea of political economy. So it takes the Immigration Acts of 62, 68 and 71, which narrow Britishness, which link Britishness consistently to whiteness, um, which try to take the best aspects of powerlism, which is a kind of dismissal that Britain itself had an empire or had responsibilities to those people who were once British subjects. Um, and it traces this in, a, in the manner of saying, well, what is the economic relationship to this? And Sivananda kind of goes through the idea that there was a era of laissez-faire immigration that allowed people in because it was it was to the interests of capital and the rebuilding of British society but then once that kind of interest drains off and the state can no longer um, accommodate uh, what he calls settlers because people were coming as British subjects rather than as immigrants you have to turn this up and Sivananda says to put it crudely the economic profit from immigration had gone to capital the social cost had gone to labor but the resulting conflict between the two would be mediated by the common ideology of racism. And so here we have a straightaway theorization of how immigration, um, capitalist social relations and racism are brought into play to mediate, via the state to mediate conflict, right? And this is the kind of first theorization of, of how British political economy and its immigration are, are tied together. And we'll return to this at the end because I think it does massive, it, it kind of reveals Things that we think are simple policy choices are actually really path dependency locked in by the state and by the British state's um, historical foundations. And what Stephen Adam does in this article, and I've got another article, which is another whole different talk, is he reflects on a whole, I think, five to six years of narrations of Britain's entrance into the EEC, what that means for British immigration policy, what that means also to how. Um, the idea of the proletariat in Britain is constructed. And in, in this article, he has this wonderful graph, which sits as my Twitter background now, um, where he talks about essentially the, the kind of dissection between the working class, between the idea of indigenous workers, non-indigenous workers. And we see here Britain's kind of colonial and neo-colonial endeavors in that kind of stretching of the two, right? And the reason I'm showing you this is because I'm gonna come back at the end and say, Siva's work basically explains why we have these crazy racist moments with the British state even today, right? So this kind of um, typology of the, what becomes the British proletariat is a pivotal moment in the kind of political economy of Britain because by entering into the EEC, by limiting non-white immigration, by transferring the status of what were British subjects and citizens into immigrants, into um, contract workers, into visa workers eventually, um, Sivananda basically charts a kind of change in British political economy, a really big change, where Britain now, as he says, has two reserve pools of labor in the undeveloped South of Europe and in the underdeveloped part of the third world. And he basically says, one is for unskilled or seasonal workers, one is for skilled and professionals, and both peripheries now provide Britain with these, um, with these essential workers. And this, in a sense, is going to become one of the key points of what neoliberalism is going to do to this relationship, and we'll get to this right at the end. All right, now we move the, the narrative on. The two foundational works that Sivanandan uses in the Hockham of New Times article are his 
subsequent work on imperialism. Um, imperialism in a disorganic development in the silicone age in 1979, and the new circuits of imperialism, which is uh, published in 1988, if I'm right, um, become the kind of fulcrum of what he's going to say is happening to the global economy. And as we'll see, that little transformation of British political economy also is affected by, by this kind of big transformation in the global economy. This is a narration of what we could call neoliberal globalization. What happens when not just neoliberalism in the nation state, but neoliberalism in the global arena happens? And these two articles, which I've seemingly read over and over again in the last few years, are so brilliant because they're really ahead of their time. Um, if you think that Sivan Anand's talking about a global reorganization of labor in 1979, most of us only really started getting onto that trip into the 90s. So yeah, they really are wonderful essays. And just to give you a flavor, what Sivan Anand is basically showing is the relationship between a system, capitalism, a, a process that he calls globalization, and the project, which of course is imperial extraction. And his basic argument is in those two, across in the decade of those, where those two articles are written, is that technology, the emergence of in, information technology has allowed a reor reordering of the center periphery relationship that had dominated modern capitalism from maybe 1492, right up until the midpoint of the 20th century, where you have raw materials and um, uh, human capital in the periphery, and you have the kind of, uh, processed high-end manufacturing and labor in the center. And his basic argument is, as we've come to know, that will, that all changes. So in 1979, he's saying the real big change is that uh, capital is fleeing, um, fleeing the West, fleeing advanced economies and setting itself up in what we call unadvanced economies, developing economies. And that kind of global South, global North, first world, third world divide is starting to kind of transform. But then he pushes this argument even further. And he says, actually, within the third world now are actually hierarchies of production that work together. So it's not like you just get first world conditions in the third world and third world conditions in the first world. What you actually get are hierarchies of production in the third world, where newly um, industrializing countries start to come up a bit. They're, they provide commodities to a kind of consumption based first world. But within the third world, it's not like everyone enters into that newly industrial phase. There are people, there are nations and peoples that are seemingly just raw, raw materials, simply human labor, and they feed into this new system. So there's hierarchies of production within, within the system. And then there's also hierarchies of labor, a kind of hierarchization of where labor takes place and who it takes place with, and also the exploitative elements of that. So in a kind of simple level, we can say, that industrial capitalism shifts to the global south. Yes, we can say that. But at the same time, when industrial capitalism moves to the global south, all of the safeguards that had been fought for, all of the rights that had kind of not stopped, because it doesn't stop, that's capitalism, but mediated elements of surplus value extraction had been kind of, have been got rid of, and you end up with a kind of more naked version of imperialism. But also the elements of that super exploitation um, start to really emerge in the first world as well. And this whole project is done, is, make, is not an organic process, but is actually a process of um, policy and imposition. And this is done via debt, by the IMF, the World Bank, structural adjustment programs, and the kind of formal uh, idea of war from Western advanced economies that can kind of dominate the globe. And then key, the kind of bit that people don't talk about when they read these um, these wonderful essays, is that he also has a wonderful idea of what we call disorganic development, which is if we take the idea that the biggest transformation in the last kind of three decades has been what we call disarticulated Fordism, so the breaking up of industrial um, commodity chains across the globe in order to kind of destabilize the ability of labor to hold capital to account. Sivananda takes all of that on board, narrates that as well, but also says that when these processes happen in third world nations or the global south today, as we call it, um, this is actually a disorganic process because 
the societies of where these um, industrial capital sets up don't have, like I said, any of the safeguards of democracy. And in fact, don't actually match up with the kind of cultural imperatives of those nations. And what happens then is we get the rise of a authoritarian state, normally by backing by the West. And you get authoritarian states, you get ideologies of populist fundamentalism, and these are the natural kind of processes that would emerge from this. All right. For Sivananda, this big moment is what we call the emancipation of capital from labor. As you and I and many of us here are all looking for the emancipation uh, of our own labor from capital, in fact, the inverse has happened. Capital does not need to pay for if your labor a living wage to reduce itself. It does not need labor on a long term basis. In a sense, this is really naked capitalism going on in the third world at this point. All of the safeguards are kind of gone and all of the ideas of the social wage, which you and I have, uh, are fighting for and hopefully still fighting for today, are just simply taken away. And those would be the kind of popular ideas of sweatshops um, and super exploitation. But of course, there's after effects of this. The movement of capital into these places, the disruption of ecology, the disruption of culture, the disruption of, of just peoples, creates what um, Sivanandam calls the kind of floatsum um, of refugees, migrants, and asylum seekers. This, these are the kind of real victims of, well, of latter-day imperialism, the underclass of what Sivanandam calls the silicone age of capitalism. They're expelled from their home, and when they end up here, when they end up back in the center in Europe, in, in the US, uh, they become super exploited once more. So no longer, not only super exploited in where capital has moved to the global south or third world, but when they, these people uh, voyage all the way for a better life into the kind of advanced economies, they find themselves once more exploited. And this kind of new phenomenon of this will transform in some way Sivanandan's idea of racism a bit later that we'll get onto. And so what the big debate for Sivanandan was, and I think what the de debate he was trying to have with Hall, and there's a debate to, to be had about whether they were misreading each other, which I'm sure others can chime in on, um, was that the idea that the working class or that class relationships had disappeared um, was inherently incorrect. For Sivanand and capital was still dependent on exploiting workers for profit, but that now that most of that exploitation took place outside of the peripheral vision of the West. It took out, it happened in the third world, it happens uh, at, the, at the kind of back end of the commodity chain, and we end up with the commodity rather than seeing the violence that has gone into the commodity. Um, and many of us are doing that today, as I'll talk about at the end, by just having this Zoom call. We all know where these computers came from and we all know where the lithium came from for the, for the batteries. But we can talk more about that at the end. And this is a basic critique of Eurocentric ideas of Marxism, which kind of took the idea that this transformation of the international division of labor was really dissolving the working class. But Sivanandan also theorizes what happens to advanced economies such as the UK and other places. So the emancipation of capital um, from labor wasn't simply um, the, the kind of moving of the working class from um, the advanced economies to the third world or global south, but really was the dispersal and fragmentation of labor. So you end up with the emergence of service sector work in advanced economies, but that is tied to deindustrialization, deunionization. These are all neoliberal imperatives. We have the hollowing out of democracy, but importantly, not state power. So Sivananda was very good at showing how the emergence of factorism, the emergence of neoliberalism did in some ways take the remit of the state back, but it did not transform the state um, into a kind of weak, meek uh, player, but essentially turned it into a very strong arm of capital. So we have anti-welfare, we have the ideas of being pro-individual, uh, pro the ideas of pro-individualism. And also it did another thing lost status for industrial workers in advanced economies. And it did a crucial thing that we don't talk about enough today, which is Sivanan has this wonderful idea that the neoliberal process disaggregates and segregates the working class in places like the UK along racial and ethnic lines. And it gives a wonderful example um, 
in Poverty is the New um, Black, Poverty is the New Black in 2001, where he talks about how in Northern mill towns, which had become at that point the focus of, of the kind of collapse of British multiculturalism, what had happened in the deindustrialization process wasn't simply that say white workers had become deindustrialized and didn't have jobs anymore. Actually, they were accompanied by specifically Asian workers in these places. And as deindustrialization happened, the working class, which was a cross racial, um, uh, comp composed, comprised of a cross racial constituency, was actually disaggregated, right? It was torn apart. And then the Asian component of, of that working class in those areas found its um, new vocation and new livings in service sector economies, whether that was the restaurant trade, whether that was cabbing, but what this did was, was break any of the working class solidarity um, that once existed in those places. And chiefly for us, historically, we don't now then see ethnic minorities as being part of the working class. They're headed somewhere else. The working class is in the imaginary white, it's deindustrialized, and maybe it doesn't have anything to do, it doesn't have any jobs. But Sivan Annan is quite clear that neoliberalism actually segregates um, the British working class along these lines. I'm not going to get too much into the last point, which is the breakdown of anti-racist solidarity, because that's a different talk, but we can talk a little bit about that in the Q&A. Um, just in very simple senses, for, for Sivan and then the emergence of neoliberalism would destabilize the anti-black struggle, um, the black struggles, the anti-racist struggles of the 1960s, 1970s and 1980s, um, which had unified all non-white communities or parts of non-white communities across Britain and break everyone into ethnic enclaves, whether that was Asian, uh, whether that was black, Caribbean, African, or any other ethnicity that could, that could be conjured up. And in response to this, um, Sivan Annan coins a new term, which is xeno-racism, because he starts to make the argument that neoliberalism in Britain, actually in response to these changes and migration, the emergence of asylum seekers and mig uh, economic migrants, really there was no difference between them. And that the old color coded racism that had defined the 60s and 70s had given way to an even larger form of racism because racism for Sivan and never stands still. And this was what we could call xeno-racism. This was racism which was based on xenophobia and on color-coded old ideas of racism. And this is quite powerful because what Sivan and is reflecting on is how the political economy of what we first started of in Britain in the 1970s um, starts to crumble under neoliberalism and gives off new forms of racism, which are not so simple to just simply get at, right? The hostility shown to say Eastern Europeans in, in the 2000s is not so easily reconcilable with a traditional idea of racism that deals with people like that maybe look like me, right? And what Sivan Anand says is, is, well, actually the neoliberal phase, this transformation of the global economy affects British political economy um, by transforming the state, by, by getting rid of certain forms of statuses, but that the migrants um, and economic migrants, the asylum seekers that will come for all of these processes now are dealt with via racialization, via xenophobic racism. And he just gives a really nice definition where he says, where the national state works primarily in the interests of multinational corporations, where the national bourgeoisie collaborates with international capital, where the middle class is effiate and self-serving, the working class disaggregated and dispersed by technology has lost its political clout. This is the context in which we have to adjust to the changing nature of racism and from that conversely, the kind of changing nature of the society we live in, right? So Sivan Anand's idea is that we need to kind of, in response to this, and I think also in response to the work of Hall and the others who were trying to theorize how you could bring new social movements together, was we would also need to re-theorize what this neoliberal moment meant for Britain. And this neoliberal moment for Britain is, in a sense, a moment of what we could call racial capitalism. Or whether Sivan Anand would use that term, I don't know, although we did hang out with Cedric Robinson. Um, and his main argument here is we had to deal with the institutional expressions of this. Anti-racism was integral to dealing with the kind of um, machinations of a neoliberal global economy because the anti-racist struggle around 
what was happening to migrants, what was happening to asylum seekers, what was happening to refugees, but also what was happening to this idea of class, um, where it was deaggregated and segregated, were key to dealing with how neoliberalism was kind of playing out in Britain. And then to kind of give this all, and this is a bit of a sprawling presentation, because Sivan Anna's work is literally too big to contain in a 40 minute lecture. His argument goes on in, in the Hockham piece and in pieces throughout the 80s and 90s that the changes in British political economy and the global economy also meant changes in how we was kind of theorize and deal with resistance. In loose ways, Sivananda didn't think that organized labor in the West was, was the primary agents of resistance to capital now because it couldn't be, because of disarticulated Fordism, because of the hierarchies of production. Um, how could it be? And whether it should have been in the first place is a totally different issue that we can ever talk about in the Q&A. The kind of apparent new arrival of social movements, which were really just along lines of ethnicity and gender and sexuality, which had been theorized in the 70s and 80s, and of course of what the, the Hocken of New Times is a kind of response to, is not Sivanandan dismissing those as identity politics, but asking for them to be re-theorized as communities of resistance. And this is where resistance to neoliberalism or the market state now had to take place. It was via these kind of fractured identities, but it was saying, what is the class component of these identities? How does class apply to this? And the reason that is, is not to give a primacy of class because Sivanandan was never about that. He was about expanding the horizon, but it was to center in what it was that you were resisting, which should be, what Sivananda called the market state, what you and I would call the neoliberal state um, and the neoliberal global economy. And as late as 2013, Sivananda kind of points at where he, he was looking at. And he was looking at these kind of what you call less spectacular resistances. And this was in response to austerity, but we could do this throughout the nineties, throughout the noughties. Um, he took solace in the idea that amongst the kind of rank and file in, in battles over health, in education and welfare, housing and community, there was an emergent resistance in these places, smaller community struggles. And in many of the essays he writes, he, he talks about them, talks about the kind of uh, anti-migration anti watch uh, uh, movements. He talks about Broadwater Farm, the Broadwater Farm estate struggle. He talks about, um, later on anti-austerity struggle. These struggles, which were really in the community, right? Which were where, where people were really struggling, were where he found some solace, maybe less so in organized labor, but maybe Gargi might want to talk about that with me a bit later. Um, and what he saw in that was a kind of emergent awakening from the public around the idea that there's no alternative to neoliberalism. Even if there wasn't a program or a goal beyond the kind of immediate goal of simply defending one's community center or fighting against cuts in one's local community or fighting for better standards of housing. There was the chance to build together, right? To open up the horizon. And we don't have time for this, but one of the reasons Sivanan is making that argument, I think anyway, is, is to kind of get over the pitfalls of an old kind of class reductionism, which is very white and male. All right, I'm just going to end this kind of talk. I'm, I don't know how much time I have, but I'll come to the end in a bit. And I just want to pick out some of the things that we might want to look at, why this is really interesting. Um, I haven't been able to give it justice in, a, in the small time I have here, but why this is really interesting for me and why it could be really interesting for us. Why Sivan Anand's work is, I think, the conscience of all anti-racism in Britain today. I'll give you some examples. So when we think about anti-racism in the present, um, depending on what you're watching or reading, you may fall into kind of weird debates around um, acronyms, right? Like, don't call me BAME. This is the rejection of the idea that we can be homogenized together, um, which really goes back to the idea of political blackness, which united non-white communities in, in a kind of common struggle against the British state. Or, you know, we might want to talk about kind of Oxford and Cambridge graduates and whether we could get specifically Afro-Caribbean students into Oxbridge. These are all in some ways, um, wor should I call them worthy causes? They are worthy, I'm not going to dismiss them, whatever. But they are not in a sense, my causes of what anti-racism means. Because anti-racism should have a 
as Sivananda tells us, an appreciation of how capital and exploitation are wrapped up in it. As he would say, we need to differentiate between the racism that discriminates and the racism that kills. And maybe the racism that kills is the things that we really have to kind of focus on. And that will bring us back to the face of the British state, which is, I guess, pretty, but very not pretty in its actions and processes. And what does that mean? Well, it means we can take Sivan Andan's work and we can look at things like the Windrush scandal, right? And I'm doing that because that's what the British state has called it, a Windrush scandal. But really, if we read Sivan Andan's political economy, this isn't a Windrush scandal. This is actually just the normal machinations of the British state. And it's kind of crunch point in the mid seventies between two forms of colonial relationships with its old um, empire and its new expansion into Europe. And so at the height of this year's craziness, which was the coronavirus pandemic, and just before that, two events happened. And I want you to think about this. In February, um, there was a big struggle on the ground um, against the deportation of Jamaican citizens, what the British called Jamaica citizens, but really many British citizens um, who were being deported, right, on a charter flight. So charter flights out. When the coronavirus pandemic hits um, and the British food system and its food chain start to fall apart, there's charter flights in of Romanian fruit pickers. These events are not coincidental. They are not, um, they are not kind of um, just random policies. If we take Sivan Andan's idea of the political economy of the British state and how race and capital are fed into each other, they are actually built into the state. This is how Britain's political economy works. It wants to, it's, wants to deport bits of its old colonial um, possessions because it doesn't want to admit that they were ever part of Britain. It also wants to extract people from Europe. And I could add another slide here how it still wants to extract people from its old colonial possessions to fill its national health service, right? So Britain's political economy is still driven by the kind of racial histories that underpin it. Can we go further? Well, of course we can go further because we're gonna have Brexit soon and we're gonna have you know, the reinstatement of Britain, a, a great Britain. Right, there's Boris running over a little Japanese child just to show you how great we are. What does this mean though? Well, we're still dealing with the after effects of what Sivan Andan called the, um, the disaggregation and segregation of class. So you will see uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've had many a uh, talking head on TV, normally a political science professor who likes to eat books on TV, um, talking about how working class white boys um, have don't have white privilege and anti-racism is bad because it thinks all white people have these forms of uh, privilege at the same time right that this is being made and the idea that essentially bme people are actually not part of the working class and you can talk about working class boys and you can talk about bme populations we have things like the boohoo scandal right so Back in July, Boohoo, which produces uh, loungewear, I think, I'm not really a partaker in it, was done for modern slavery, right? Essentially big scandal around modern slavery, um, South Asian women and um, South Asian women and Eastern European women basically being forced to produce um, garments for less, way less than the minimum wage at £3.50 an hour, according to undercover reports. Listen, if we take Sivan Andan's work and we talk about the kind of idea of how class is dispersed and exploitation is uh, kind of dispersed in Britain, this is not a shock. Listen to what Sivan Andan writes in 1989. He talks about capital being able to take up its factory and walk anywhere where it proves less costly to produce things, right? And he gives a number of examples. He talks about Ford heading out of the UK um, and heading into, into Europe. He talks about the movement into um, Southeast Asia and then he says this, and in the Midlands, Asian garment makers have combined new manufacturing techniques with cheap Asian female labor to undercut garment imports from Asia. Sound familiar? There is nothing new about the racialized economy of Britain and this kind of um, de-aggregation and segregation of the working class. It's built into British political economy. Sivan Andan's work does that very well for us, shows us that it's 
key there, that race and class are entwined into the British state and its economy. And then finally, we might want to look at why Sivanandan thought anti-racism was so pivotal to dealing with modern capitalism, right? So last couple of weeks, um, critical race theory has been given uh, more airtime than ever. I don't even know that many people in Britain who do critical race theory. It's a very American thing. We have our own traditions of anti-racism, but the British state cannot shut up about critical race theory. Critical race theory apparently is being taught in schools, um, universities, it's anti-white, it's um, the devil incarnate. It's also anti-capitalist, um, which is quite funny because one of the kind of critiques of critical race theory is that it doesn't really have an economic component, but anyway. And we've seen um, Kemi Bandock on TV saying Black Lives Matter is anti-capitalist. Simon Anna's work is wonderful in, in, in appreciating why the British state is going through this thing, right? In the Race and Class and State essay, he writes, the anxiety of the state about re rebellious black youth stems not from rhetoric of professional black militants whose dissidents it can accommodate and legitimize within the system, but from the fear of the mass politics that it, that it can generate in the black underclass and over discriminated minority um, groups like minor uh, migrant workers and perhaps the working class as a whole, particularly at a time of massive unemployment and urban decay. Just say, sounds very similar to where we are because race and class are entwined into the British state, its labor market, and also how the effects of any forms of cuts play out. And I just wanna end with a couple of things about why anti-racism, Sivan and for anti-racism was such a good tool and why is theorization of race and class is really why we should be recovered today. The summer has seen kind of a massive surge in, um, in anti-racist activity, both in the US and the UK, in, in a kind of reckoning with an older empire and older ideas of, um, of restitution, of reparation. And Edward Colston being thrown into, into, the, uh, into the dock at Bristol kind of sum that up. And in many ways, that is a wonderful reckoning with Britain's past. It's a reckoning with the erasure of, of the value given by the enslaved, by also the colonized um, and by other kind of exploited groups within the British Empire. But what Sivan Anders' work kind of tells us is that relationship doesn't stop and it hasn't stopped for the last two to 300 years. Whilst we have to pay respect to the singularity of chattel slavery and its contribution to Britain, and we should make arguments for its restitution and reparation, we must also understand that those processes which link race and class together have not stopped and continue to underpin who we are, right? And like I said, that's just kind of evident by the platforms that we want today. From the batteries in, in our laptops, to the child labor that produces them, to the super exploited labor um, that produces them in, in China, and the idea that the intellectual property is generated in the US. So you and I buying them at extortionate prices, these commodities here today. The violence, the racialized violence of exploitation that underpins all of that is still very much with us. And Sivan Anna's work points to the fact that if we really want to be anti-racist, then we have to be anti-imperialist. We have to be anti-capitalist. So Kemi Bandot maybe is right. You probably do want to ban us because that's what we want to bring down. And this will become even more um, prevalent as we see the kind of after effects, I say after effects, because we're still living through it, of the COVID-19 pandemic, where race and racialization, super exploitation of racialized minorities and death, which is the ultimate kind of end of all super exploitation, has shown to be prevalent in Britain and the US. Over representation of minorities in, in, in deaths in the UK is largely driven by their racialized uh, labor market. By the, de by the de aggregation and segregation of the working class that's happened in Britain over the last 30 to 40 years. And in some ways, we're gonna to have to put those communities back together. How do we bring those struggles together? How do we bring the kind of struggle against the wanton euthanization of people by the state with its racialized ideas about who should actually die first, with anti-racism, with the struggle against um, 
what will be mass unemployment in the next few months with, when the furlough is wound up properly in December, with the cuts that will eventually come to pay for this, and also with the global imbalances that the system will create. So we already know now that countries in the global south um, will struggle to uh, finance themselves as debt skyrockets in the global south, that the old north-south divide will also be locked in further. In some ways, Stephen Andrews' work kind of compels us to think that's what anti-racist struggle should be about. And I just want to end with this quote um, from Sivan Anden, just to kind of get at what I'm getting at. And I think Gargi might take issue with a bit of this, but anyway, we can talk about it. In, in theorizing the kind of new times of neoliberalism and what he thought was the nonsense of the theorization of, of people like Stuart Hall, what Sivan Anden was trying to get to do was not deny that new things had happened, but actually how we went about kind of dealing with the, these new sets of circumstances had to be rethought. And he, and he ends um, one of his articles by saying, what we have learned from the labor movement, what we must hold on to are not the old ways of organization, the old modes of thought, the old concepts of battle against capital, but the value and traditions that we've hammered out on the smithy of these battles, loyalty, solidarity, camaraderie, unity, all the great and simple things that make us human. And then he, he goes on later on in the essay and he says, we have cultures of resistance to create, communities of resistance to build, a world to win. Now is the moment of socialism. And I particularly like these words and I think we need them right now. And capital should have no dominion. All right, I'll leave it there. Um, thank you, John. Um, that was very enlightening. So Gargi, if you're ready to take over um, with your discussion, just start whenever you're ready. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thanks so much for that, John. It really covered loads of ground. Um, and you only want me to talk for a few minutes, don't you? So I'm just going to have my phone out. I think I'm just going to raise, raise the points I always raise <laughs> a little bit. Um, and I hope some questions that we might take up in the discussion. I think some of the things that John is describing are about Siva's writing at, of course, an earlier moment about the idea of the um, displacement of where the labourer who can be maintained in life was at that certain, that earlier moment in the kind of 80s and 90s. Oh, my screen is going all over the place. Don't know if that means you can't see me. Um, I think we've been living through a much more uncertain and uneven landscape of who can live and who is surplus. And I think that's also, you know, because it's 20 years on, 25 years on, about um, where the centres of manufacturing and other economic activity are. We're seeing that. We're seeing that also in where the centres of labour organisation are. And I think that doesn't change the argument, but I think it makes a different question for us, or a different set of organising challenges. But that's, you know, this is all historical, isn't it? So what Syria is um, predicting, we've kind of lived through that. That's, that brings us to here. Of, and um, boo-hoo aside, we know that actually there are plenty of places where capital requires labor to just about live. And some of those places are in the global south, but not evenly so. And so that dispersal of where the labor that can live and the labor can be let die is located. I think, oh, that kind of, that's both a political analytic and analytic question. I think for us, I just kind of think it's interesting and it makes a difference to how we narrate what an anti-imperialist anti politics might be for us now and the um, links between class organisation and anti-imperialist work. Um, there's always a kind of gap, isn't there, between what big figure writes and then we all try and talk about it and then what we talk about next. At the very least, I'd say it probably is not to our benefit and perhaps not even quite um, true to all of the writing to act as if the disaggregation of the working class along racialized lines is a movement away from a former unity. I'm, I'm not, I don't think really Seven Anden is writing about a former unity of the working class in this country then, then is disaggregated. It's, you know, it's different things happen, don't, don't they? But for Britain, the working class is disaggregated through empire, so you don't have to see those other people because they're being working class somewhere else. You know, capital is collecting this stuff across the globe. Then suddenly we show up. 
oh no, that wasn't meant to happen. So, and then we have the moment of crisis, which is kind of the, just the moment before Zira is writing about, like, oh, you know, you weren't meant to be in the room with me. Then new techniques of disaggregation happen, both through state violence and also to reflect shifts in the economic base. And I only say that because I think always, and perhaps now particularly, there's always a danger for even for the left to be kind of nostalgic for a moment of unity that's been lost. That's not what the game we're in, I don't think. And I think it's important for us to say that to each other. That doesn't mean that unity is not still the game in town. But what we do is somewhat different if we say it, if we say, oh, there used to be left unity and then we're all fragmented and then um, and then we all became identitarians. That leads to a different politics than to say capital is in every incarnation that's ever been known has disaggregated the working class, but through different kinds of technique and violence. For us to fight it, we must at least understand the technique of disaggregation and, the, and its particular violence for our moment. Not because there's something to go back to, but because you need to see the beast as it is, not as you wish or imagine it would be. So that's, you know, that's a tiny point, but I hope we'll move us on to what I always want to talk about is, you know, where are we going to go with this? Um, and I guess the small other thing I'd say is, some of that um, idea of races being such an organizing factor is also a kind of reflection of the self-organization of black and brown communities, necessarily. Not completely, not shaped by it, but something that makes that terrain is about the ways in which community organization articulates itself, not only as race, as class as well, but then how that then becomes a dialogue, especially a dialogue with the state. And I think we've all been through the critiques of the ways in which, um, easy to say in hindsight, but really cul-de-sacs around engagement with different state structures. I always think, you know, it's a bit easy, isn't it, to say how we've always lost before. Oh, I wouldn't have been so stupid. I don't think anyone in the room would have been wise enough to think, oh yes, after the Lawrence inquiry, what we'll do is say, oh no, no, to engagement with the state. Now that set of engagements was not a liberal set of engagements. It was a multi-pronged set of engagements, but frankly, I think it depleted and dispersed anti-racist energies in a way that we are still trying to recover from. Who could have known? You know, I don't, I say that only to say that the reasons why um, collect dispersed movements take actions which then in hindsight seem like, oh, what a loser set of careerists you were, are often for the best collective analysis and that there's something about trying, what would it take for us to have the collective analysis to lessen the chances of that? And we still might be wrong or we still might get outplayed because the point is not to be right in the seminar, but to win, which is always the point I'd like to end on. Um, no solace in organised labour, you know. There's almost nothing I hate more than the British labour movement. And yes, it and yet it is kind of the heart of my life for the last 30 years. It takes half of my time. Um, still is something that I think could be remade to be a different thing. And I would say that, again, to have no no false nostalgia for an organised labour that never existed, but not equally not to imagine a collective future that does not include the role of organised labour, even if that is not quite the role of organised labour imagined by the TUC. That even a disaggregated working class with fragmented class identities, precarious work, gig economies, maybe most of all at that time, the question of what labour organisation means as a collective class project is not one that we conduct. And so I say it because, you know, if old blokes like me don't say it, old bloke of the labour movement, who is going to say it? <clears throat> but so, of course, the questions for us, they're kind of always the same questions, but how you populate the question becomes different with the analysis of the moment. Still, now, then, probably for some time, scalability remains a challenge, doesn't it? 
as, the, as does the kind of organisational vehicle available. I don't think there's much disagreement amongst a whole range of people broadly on the left, broadly in progressive politics, some of whom are calling themselves anti-racist, some of whom are not, about the need to mobilise a broad front which recognises the, the um, intertwined violences of race and class, which recognises the violence abroad and the violence here, which recognises how cheap our lives have become in an echo of how cheap many people's lives have been for centuries. You know, that, that's all within our collective analysis, isn't it? Saying it is like, well, when, what then is our idea of what it would mean to organise together? And I think we still kind of lack, we certainly lack the habit and the skill set, but I think we even lack the language of how to speak to each other to make the scalable organisational vehicle speakable to each other. And so I think that before I die, I'd like to have that conversation. And I wanted to say just one more thing about that. So practice isn't just, oh, I saw a street campaign, didn't you? My street campaign is better than yours. I'm as guilty of that as anyone else. But you know, we need to do a little bit better than that because they're killing us. You know, John's told us. They were always killing us, and now they're not even ashamed to tell us. <clears throat> but at the same time, there is a kind of role for revolutionary imagination. And that means we have to open ourselves to the ways we speak to each other in terms of analysis, in terms of scholarship, in terms of creativity, but also in a way that we might be able to be mistaken because we're being mistaken towards a common goal, which is our collective freedom. And I'm not sure if that makes sense to anyone, but I hope someone else will want to take up that, that bludgeon. Okay, is that too long, long enough? Anyway, long enough. Thank you. Um, so you guys can start asking questions and they'll keep coming through. So I'll pose some of these questions to you, um, to both of you, and you can answer them. You can answer them and discuss. Um, I thought your point about you know, the, the disaggregation kind of morphing into a different um, form of disaggregation was really salient. And um, I think we got a question which touches upon that. So it says, um, if a disaggregated working class was never aggregated in the UK, um, as Gargi noted, is there any hope given the visibility of minority death, at least at the start of the pandemic, that the COVID um, could lead to some aggregation um, or some public consciousness that the working class is more than just white? Shouldn't John go first? She said. Is there, is there, I don't know, is there a... What is... <laughs> Um, there's my dog. My dog went first. Um, okay. Um, that's Roz, isn't it? That's Ro That's my Roz who's asked that question. I love you, Roz. By the way. Um, okay. I agree with that point, and I totally Gargi's point about the idea that they were that the class politics of Britain has never been together is correct, right? I don't think Sivanandan's arguing for a nostalgic moment of uh, alignment, but I do think he's arguing that there was a, there was an organic process of some form of unity in those former mill towns, right? I mean, we've got to take the idea that I'm, I'm taking essays totally out of context and dragging them together for you. So it's, it's, it's difficult to get at. Is there hope for unity? Yeah, of course, otherwise we wouldn't be here, right? I mean, like, Come on, we would none of us would be here um, if we wouldn't be here. And there are ways of doing things together that necessarily can bring us together around these kind of sensible ideas of justice, equality, and and other things. And sometimes they come up in really innocuous ways. I mean, like, I'm really loath to say this because I don't like I don't like the practitioners behind it. But look. It's no coincidence that the white working class academics, the ones who bang on about the white working class boys, had nothing to say really about Marcus Rashford's campaign about free school meals. Right? They didn't have anything to say about it. Right? But it, you would have thought that they would have been front and center of it. Well, they didn't want the idea that you could try and create unity between kind of poor, dispossessed um, school children. Right? Now, I don't technically agree with. Um, <laughs> 
with you know the idea of recreating the big society and all these things but we there are platforms and ideas that will do that and i think even with covid covid offers the kind of idea well where is the unity so I, i'm not sure um I'm not a big believer that all white people are the devil because I don't, and that's clearly not in Sivan Anand's analysis. Racism doesn't work that way. It's an institutional structure. So we, we, there are ways of bringing us together, but we'll have to, we'll have to, we'll have to work on these things together. That's my key on. And I wondered if that was actually the question, not are white Brits so racist that there's no hope, but is there something about pandemic which moves the locus of where we think about who lives and who dies, which despite itself and despite the Johnson government unsettles those racialized lines, which I think we're already living through. But then there's the question of what it would mean to organize and what our political vehicles are, which might be more than one political vehicle. In, you know, if ever any what people groups, you know, a generation of people lived through what seeing state neglect as authorized death at different rates were we are those people so you know, and, and we have a whole analysis of that what we don't yet have although I think people as always people try and piece together bits don't they I think that's when you talk about momentary unity in the northern mill town that's it that, and that was a momentary unity I'd like to say using the most old-fashioned tools of organized labor yeah. that's that was trade unionism wasn't it but it, it's fragmentary and kind of momentary Equally, I think there's something about pandemic, especially as it rolls out and um, the level of dissatisfaction with official and state responses is so widespread. It's both dangerous because you can see a kind of neo fash element coming in, but there's also a political opening for different kinds of languages of mutuality and what survival and an anti-state model of survival, which is pretty exciting, I think, could come about. But none of this is about stuff we say to each other. It's about our ability to translate those ideas into organisational structures, even if they're small momentary organisational structures in the first instance. So that's also it, you know, try out something small, but it has to be in the first instance, otherwise. Yeah, and there's been, oh, and there's been, there's been movements like, right? And some of these things are half measures as well. So um, the dropping of the NHS surcharge, which hasn't actually properly happened though, for um, extracted migrant workers, right? Um, me and Roz work on that together about how the NHS is really partly an imperial system. Um, that is a that is a kind of push towards a form of internationalism, right? Mm -hmm. Right, even if it's a halfway house, but like yeah. you have to work yeah. with it and push push further. So it should be, oh great, yeah, like we don't want the surcharge to apply to migrant workers in the NHS. Oh, and by the way, we just want to get rid of the surcharge. <laughs> so I feel like there's there's that pushing, right? And the pandemic offers does mm -hmm. offer these spaces for that. But also there's a retrograde, there's also a regressive moment mm -hmm. against these things, I think. Can I just say one more thing? And just because I'm interested to talk to John about it, and I don't know everyone else in the room, that I think also for us to speak to each other, which understands pushing as not just making a claim, because even the language of making a claim assumes a functioning state that could be our liberal interlocutor. So that, which I also think is part of our, our need to develop a better shared language. And I'm not saying you're doing it, but just you've given me an opportunity to say it, which is one of the things I wanted to say, that pushing might instead be, if you mobilize with some health workers about the loss of the surcharge, how does that also allow a different kind of mobilization with a slightly bigger slice of people about something else? How do you put those slices of mobilization together? That is what building a vehicle that both is scalable and has an organizational hit means. But those skills, um, I think, are very devalued in this country and probably across the left. I think Zoom makes it worse because who can see that kind of work here? And um, and we lose them in every generation. People get burnt out and think, so some, there's something about even people who read and write a lot, and I'm one of those people, about retrieving, valuing, sharing, creating parallel fora, doing other things as well as this. Not not do this, but as well as this. Yeah. And I actually think in Sivan Anand's work that that's actually key to all of it. So I think that is the Communities of Resistance project. Mm -hmm right from my reading anyway yeah and i think um we've got a question which kind of does touch on kind of 
forming resistance in the way capital has changed and the way labor has changed. Um, how, what does Sivanandan say about forms of resistance outside of the workplace? So the, where are the non-workers located? Oh yeah, I saw that question. By non-workers, I mean, are they, I'm guessing you're getting at people who are not normally employed, right? We're talking about the gig economy and... Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm, I'm assuming from that. That's what I'm reading it as. Yeah, well, I mean, look, there are, there are just, today is a day of celebration for that movement, right? We all know about the cleaners being brought in-house at UOL. Yeah, I mean, like, there with that, hey, I don't even need to even answer this one. There is already people doing that. Um, those workers will organize themselves. I know, I don't think that, I mean, I look, I, I, look, I get the whole, you might think civil is against organized labor. I think what he's just what against, and you get this in, um, and I think it's part of that literature in the 70s that emerges from radical black thought, both in the US and ever, is that the, the, post forties phase, whatever you want to call it, globalization will mean that you cannot just simply organize whatever you could do in the first place at the workplace because the workplace disappears for large people. And part of what neoliberalism does is to take away spaces of organization. So uh, traditional ones, right? Like your union, like it's really hard to organize in a union if you don't have one. So I don't, I don't necessarily feel like there's a, we have to go at either or with this thing. I think you have to, the idea would be that you would organize in those communities of resistance so and i think also includes it would include forms of work that are not normally recognized as work which i guess would be harder to form those communities of resistance in those sense yeah yeah but i mean we are seeing um we are seeing movements around say care and mutual mutual aid Right. I mean, those are forms of resistances as well. Right. Like they are the the kind of shoring up or survival, what we call survival programs that many of us are doing in the local neighborhood are in one way resistance because they, they refuse to let our local communities literally die. I mean, what is the ultimate resistance? Right. But to stop death. I don't know. And there's also, you know, that's to recognize that the politics of care is a very, very long history for a range of communities, black, brown, white as well. There's a whole feminist agenda around that. There's a whole queer agenda around that. And that there's something about, again, pandemic, <clears throat> which refocuses that battle around care. I, I agree absolutely with mutuality, but also we're seeing develop a really um, much more intensified bottom-up analysis of who care is for, which care am I doing that because the state is shafting me which care am I doing to stay alive what are the what are the different models of care between those moments which does sadly come a bit back to claims where do you make a claim for care where do you build an alternative community of care and I think that's all kind of in, in play but undecided I also um, have a big bee in my bonnet about yes there are highly gendered models of this but um, much of the language we have of gendered models of care doesn't altogether reflect the different ways of which reproductive labor is is itself fragmented now and, and kind of acts as if gendered roles are much more solidified and even than in fact they are and I think that but I think that also that shake up shake ups always a bit of an opportunity aren't they because different people come together suddenly think oh yeah I'm that as well I'm a carer I think that's yeah that is a really good point um, so there was a question for you, Gargi, about the role of labour unions for workers outside of organised or formal labour um, is not necessarily new. Um, and so does this speak to the notion of a labour aristocracy? Right. Oh, sorry, I can't see the question. So I'm relying on your very kind reading of them. So um... I'll just read it out again for you. So the role yes, of labour workers outside of organized or formal labor is not necessarily new does this speak to the notion of the labor aristocracy i can really hear what people say with that and, and just in case people you know i don't know the ages of the people in the room so some of those terms like labor aristocracy i don't know if younger people even know what it means when i was younger like in the 70s the idea of the labor aristocracy is that 
there are certain kinds of working class jobs that are highly unionized and both have quite a lot of clout in the workplace, but actually quite a lot of political clout because of the role of large, um, powerful, still then powerful unions in relation to national politics. So the idea of the labor aristocracy is that you might be working class, but if you're a steel worker or you're a car worker, you, you get a kind, of, a kind of wages of being of the recognized fraction of the working class. And then everyone else who's like a cleaner and precarious work, precarious work's nothing new, of course, but it's just more extended now. Um, you don't get those benefits of being part of the labor aristocracy. I think what's changed, of course, is that the core sectors in which we used to think of the labor aristocracy have um, both been smashed apart in terms of organization and smashed apart in terms of actual practice. You know, that, that was mainly heavier industry, mainly male workers, mainly white workers, you know, a whole kind of remaking of the economy in this country. That doesn't mean that there aren't similar fractions of the labor of the of labor in other places because i still think actually organ if you make something that is very profitable and quite expensive to make and you have a certain amount of skill in order to make it your chances of organizing in your workplace you know they they kind of extend a bit don't they so you can see in some places there's a battle, battle going on with that right now in britain who is the labor aristocracy we have a problem that most people who are in um, trade unions tend to be overwhelmingly in the public sector, very much under attack, very odd kind of place to organise in terms of how we um, might implement our labour demands, very, a bit fragmented in a different way from other elements of the working class, often, you know, agents of the state. That's a bit tricky if the biggest labour force, you know, unionised labour force in the country are teachers, you know, because being a teacher is a funny kind of role, isn't it? And I think we have to rethink that. I think the labor movement is having to rethink that by force. It's having to rethink it because of how um, non-aristocratic workers are organizing outside formal, you know, the usual formal structures and new unions and through different kinds of emergent, glitch-filled, exciting ways of organizing, but also because being a labor aristocrat ain't what it used to be. Of course, is it? So all those, I'm sorry, that's a big round the houses thing of saying, maybe, but this might be the last gasp of that pretense. And the people in the labor aristocracy don't, don't feel like, doesn't feel like privilege to them because they're, you know, health workers would be one. BMA as an example, but look, look at the BMA, that's the thing. Be it, what a radicalized union now because dying. Yeah, that's a great point too. I think dying makes us all a bit radical, right? Yeah, um, yeah exactly. Oh, I think so. Yeah. yeah. I would just add there is there is still but it's about what though the intentions of those I guess what the radicalism is generated by a, so like take Keiichi that UCU is one, you know, is a big union, one of the last big ones left. Um sorry, which one? The one we belong to is quite a big union. Our union not well, powerful it's not powerful and it's also not clear what the imperatives are of its struggles even its struggles against marketization uh, precarious work and all that I'm, I'm not having been in it it's not clear that everyone is against these things um no see right so you know there it's not clear that the aristocracy has disappeared it's just i would agree that the what I would, you know, in another article called the wages of whiteness or whatever, that that's some of it's disappeared. It's it's not, it's not great. But then the imperatives are what does that radicalization then push you towards? Does it push you towards an anti-imperialist politics, even in the immediate sense? Or does it does what what happens to you? Do you just want to go back to what it was? You know, well, like, well that's up for grabs, isn't it? So yeah. again, like nothing happens to you automatically. What happens to you depends on what people in concert are doing around you and and politics yeah. it could make you lots of people in our sector um their response to marketization is a, an unashamed nostalgia for an aristocratic university i think even quite a lot of the so-called left of our union think that oh if only universities were like they were in the 70s when people like you and me would not be here frankly exactly yeah that, <laughs> that, that but that's that's a struggle, isn't it? It's not decided. No, no, that is a struggle. 
Yeah, and I think um, on the point, I think you made a point earlier, Gagi, about um, COVID and how it's created an opportunity, but also an opportunity for, you know, the, on the right. And mm. um, someone asked a question about what, you know, Silver uh, Nandan's take could be on the failure of neo neoliberalism and the emergence of populist far right movements. And if there's a correlation, then how class comes into that. I, I mean, I look at the theorization of how um, civil uh, theorization of how Islamic fundamentalism turns up is quite simple, right? It is a response. Then the far right elements, they're not really a response. They're normally a, uh, an excuse, right? They're the excuse for continuing. Trumpism is the excuse for the continuation of the system, just in, in very uh, visceral racist means. Do you know, right? So, for example, you know, it, all right, we will reference the US election, even though I promise not to, right? Think about it. Trump's being hopefully going to be rejected. But what Biden did was to offer basically quite a lot of what Trump already does. So you didn't need to vote for Trump this time around, right? Do you want to, do you still want to fund the police? You still want your border control? You might even have a bombing campaign in the global south. I mean, Trump didn't really give us that. So he might, he might give us that, right? So you can, the, the reality is, is that they are, um, they are ways of managing the narrative. Um, in Sivan Anand's article on, on the kind of, the, the kind of rise of Islamic fundamentalism, he, he was quite optimistic that actually that, 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 that phase would, would die out and there would be a reformation in the Islamic world around kind of anti-imperialism. Um, that hasn't really come about as much, but no, these, these are fantasies, these right-wing fantasies of taking control are normally, they're not really populist, they're elite driven. And I think Sivanandan was very good at understanding that, that they were elite driven in, in the state. I mean, Brexit for me is an elite driven project based on resentment in certain groups, but also in certain groups who, um, who are not materially dispossessed in the way that we think they are. I don't disagree about Trumpism and Brexit, but I actually didn't mean that kind of um, right, feigned right populism from above. Mm -hmm. What I'm mm -hmm. saying is that, that the moment of actual crisis does open space for right innovation from the right from yeah. below. And, and that is again why we need to ramp up our ability to speak to each other sensibly in a way that could mobilize and have organizational clout because actually we know how the elite kill us. You know, we may or may not be battling it, but in my lifetime, we have not really had to battle except in small skirmishes, a battle for the terms of life from a kind of insurgent rightist element that has the potential to be a mass movement. It, you know, that, and that is, and if we don't think that's the battle of our time, we should look at all the places that we all come from and see how it's already playing out there. So that, I think, is why we need to up our game again. Yeah, I think you make a really good link, actually, because someone did talk about um, India, given the example of India and how um, neocolonialism and the perpetuation of col um, colonialism um, is still very prevalent there with um, the master capital and how I think also in Nigeria and so on, you can see how um, the working class in those areas are, are being um, treated kind of out of the visibility um, of us here. Yeah. Um, I would say that's part of this disorganic development in the global south, right? That's mm -hmm. part of what Sivanandan theorizes. That's why it turns up like that. Yeah. Um, so, a question, so this is a reference to the Labour towns you mentioned earlier, John. Um, uh, so, a reference to Labour towns relate to these towns as both the site of working and living. So, um, I think uh, Sunil was saying that in their experience of working with migrant construction workers in India, in India demonstrate the challenge of collective action. So. I think that's kind of another example of the challenges of collective action outside of this labour aristocracy kind of that you were mentioning. Mm 
Yeah, no. I, I, have, I don't know if that's a question. It's a comment. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, maybe okay. Camille wants to talk. He can talk. If we unmute him. I don't like this idea that we don't talk. Can we? Can you talk? talk. He's got headphones. He can talk. Yeah, no, headphones. no. I, I tried to unmute myself, but this uh, control uh, in Zoom that doesn't allow you that freedom kind yeah, of silence. Yeah, it's authoritarianism, so, you know, Yes, I, I was just thinking that uh, in a face-to-face -face seminar, you can talk to the people next to you and you can heckle, which you can't do under these conditions. But now I'm just very interested in, in Simlanda's work and trying to look at how the replication uh, of the kind of processes and mechanisms is being domesticated uh, by, by kind of decolonial practices, uh, by neocolonials. And that speaks to, for example, Al Pasha's book uh, on ground down by growth, uh, which looks at Dalits who are no longer at the bottom of the agricultural hierarchy, but they are now at the bottom of the industrial hierarchy. They're working in poultry and in tanning and so on and so forth. So the mobility has been sideways rather than upwards. And uh, neocolonialists, i.e. financial capital and the state are using the ideas of colonialism and imperialism and, and using it with a, with a vengeance. And in a way, we're trying to speak to some of those groups, but yet we are, we are unsuccessful. And the point I was making about collective organization in my work on uh, migrant construction workers, where the work place and the residents become combined uh, in labor camps, it's almost impossible to think of forms of collective organization. So those are the kind of questions I had in relation to where do we take the, the object of our analysis now? It's not just disorganized capitalism. These are, this is a concerted effort to maintain those very structures that enabled these various exploitations to take place. Do you, okay. Do you wanna go first, guy? I think it goes back to Gargi's point about language <laughs> and how we talk to each other, right? Like how we develop those, um, how do we develop the kind of ways of talking to each other and, and relating to each other on an experience level that, um, that create forms of solidarity. And I don't think we've, I don't mean we've recovered elements. And I do think history shows us that we can do that. There is, was a viscerality to organizing in, the, in 30, 40 years ago that would have really been quite useful now. Um, but it is about how do we create common forms of languages and, and discussions around injustice and maybe using the kind of pivot point of, um, of the current crisis is one way of doing that. But I think it's, a, I don't think there's an easy answer here. I think it no, literally no, I, I, I think my point, was, my point was perhaps how the emphasis on racialized um, uh, forms of exploiting so, so forth kind of almost ignores not just the exploitation in the working place, but the actors behind it. And, and I think it's almost like colonialism doesn't exist in the South anymore kind of mm. argument, or, or we're, talking about, we're talking about events in the past and reparations and all that, when they're actually, it's alive and well, and it's thriving, you know? But, but I would argue, I mean, I'll argue, I mean, I'd like to suggest that the analysis of racial capitalism only makes sense or is only useful as a way of trying to understand the constant and ongoing violent disaggregation of the working class in many locations. And it might not be articulated as race, but race is the way of arguing that how bodies are organized around an arbitrary division. And that I'd say what you're describing is as much racial capitalism as what the previous thing is. But my, what I really, the thing that, of the many things that keep me awake at night, the one that I think most of all is that I don't think we have ever seen um, an effective mass mobilization against industrialized fascism. We've seen a, a kind of interpower war, which didn't stop it. We are now seeing, I hear what, when I hear what you're saying, that, um, you know, who, who from the subcontinent could not think this? And not only from there, as people said, look at what's happened in Nigeria in the last month, but um, a willingness in many different centers of capital to mobilize really mass murder 
and, and genocide, I don't want to say genocide lightly, but at least the run up to genocide um, in the interests of absolutely containing and wiping out some sections of the population for other kinds of accumulative ends. You know, I don't know how else to describe it. Now, that seems to me something that we have no model of how we, and I mean we, our side, because which is also about how we speak to each other. The small differences between us are as nothing as compared to this, that we are living through the never again and we are not, not even able to say it to each other yet. I don't have the answer, but I certainly think that we must start to say that the question in these terms to each other, because otherwise, what are we otherwise? Yeah, yeah. I think that would be a really good point um, to, to leave us to think um, as we end this session, as unfortunately our time has run out. Um, so thank you very much to um, both John and Gargi for coming to speak um, and to all of you for, for listening. Um, join us um, in the next talk, um, which will be on the 18th of November, 5 p.m. on Orientalism and Economic Theory um, by Jan Toporowski and Gilbert um, Achar. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, I hope you've absorbed all of that information and we can try to find a new language um, to be able to speak and try to create a, a point of unity moving forward. All right, thank you guys. Thank you for having me. And sorry to be such a miserable